The open source model has been used by many sectors, healthcare, scientific research, and of course in software development. And now it's being used in the nonprofit world. The Mozilla Foundation, an online nonprofit, is one institution applying open source principles to boost its initiatives. And Mark Sermon, executive director of the Mozilla Foundation, is here to tell us more. Mark, good to see you again. Welcome back to TVO. Always happy to be here, Steve. Uh, let's just off the top, everybody knows Firefox. Mozilla and Firefox, they go together like mom and apple pie. <laughs> what else do you do? Well, you know, Mozilla actually uh, is a, a nonprofit that was set up, if you go back to our charter, to guard the open nature of the internet. So what does that mean? It, it meant in 2003 when we started that the, the way you saw the web, the web browser, really had been kind of shut down, so there was only one way to do it, and it was through Microsoft. And so there was a kind of bunch of very idealistic people who said, we actually want to make sure there's some choice. We want to make sure that the core open technologies of the internet are available to people, not just sort of Microsoft's view of seeing the internet. So there was 10 people, but then thousands of volunteers who stepped up to say, we want to give people a choice, and that was Firefox. And so originally the idea was we can use volunteerism, we can use open source to create choice on the internet. But now we're actually doing the same thing in mobile phones, the same thing in education, and really I focus a lot on doing the same thing in digital literacy, helping the whole world learn how the web works. And for those who don't know, open source refers to? Just the, the idea at the most basic sense that you can see the computer software code. That's what open source means very literally, but it's become a whole philosophy, a whole way of doing things, which means you know, people being able to pitch in, people being able to build on top of each other's work. You want to make the analogy to a Lego box set? I, I do like the idea of a Lego box set. And really, the, I mean, it's not just open source, which is a very specific term about software. It's that broader idea of open. And the web is built on the idea that really there's a set of open building blocks like Lego that anybody could make anything with. How does open source promote the idea of the development of the web as a public resource? Well, you know, really the, the idea is that the web is something that anyone can build on without permission from anybody else. I mean, think about that 50 years ago or when you and I were growing up. Uh, if I had an idea and wanted to get out there, I had to go ask the producer of the agenda or a publisher or somebody to get my idea out there in the world. Some gatekeeper. Some gatekeeper. And so now we've actually got a system where very few gatekeepers exist, although that's a tension that we now uh, fight. Anybody with an idea for a business, for a book, for a piece of art can get it out there. And that open channel for everybody, we believe is a public resource we want to keep open. You say there's a constant tension there, and I wonder what some of the threats are to having it be as open as you would like it to be. Oof, there's so many. Um, I mean, really, we've seen a tr transformation of, of creativity and also just kind of political freedom because we've got this open platform. But you have countries who are trying to shut down what you can and can't see on the internet. You've got companies who really want to put a bigger bottleneck on how information flows. They can monetize it better. You've got more closed platforms like the iPhone coming out, which you know, aren't systems where anybody can publish anything. You actually have to ask Apple's permission. So there's, I think, a, a whole range of things from governments to the market, which are counterbalances or pressures against the open nature of the internet. Can you tell who's winning? I mean, I, I like to think, uh, you know, when I watched the Arab Spring a couple of years ago, or even uh, kind of watch the silly cat videos, or, or you know, other kids making rock videos that my kids watch, I like to feel that the open internet is winning. Okay, let's talk some more about how you are taking those principles to a philanthropic purpose right. at Mozilla. Uh, give us an idea of what that entails. Well, you know, obviously, if we think the internet is a public good, just like parks are a public good or roads are a public good, and, and they're quite analogous in our mind. Uh, it's a philanthropic activity to keep those things vibrant, to tend the parks, to maintain the roads. And so what we do is we use volunteerism, we use people's donations, we also use some sort of social enterprise strategies in the market to keep that park of the internet uh, alive. But the thing is you're, you're seeing people do that in other kinds of ways as well. It's not just us. For us it kind of makes sense. It's like you use this open source approach to a public good which is the internet. But Think about Wikipedia. It's more like a library, but also you know, tens of thousands of volunteers around the world. And what's different is, I guess, probably two things. When you look at these sort of public goods which are produced you know, on the internet in this open source sort of way, it's much lower cost. You can organize many more people for you know, very, very little money. And so that's a very you know, tangible, different thing that's kind of easy to understand. 
But the other piece is you can get new ideas really from anywhere, right? If I have an idea for a change to a Wikipedia article or a new part of Firefox or a new way of teaching sort of how the web works, you just it's do really it. easy to just yeah. do it. And that's something that actually is a dramatic shift. See, I wonder whether that model can continue because, and again, using your park analogy, you need relatively well-paid unionized people to keep the park looking pristine. Right? It doesn't just stay that way, and the public is not going to do it for free, generally speaking. Can that continue? Can this continue free, open, everybody pitching in with no potential for remuneration in the world that you've described? Well, I think it's important to understand the world that, that we describe, and certainly the world that exists on the internet, is not without remuneration. Uh, you know, lots of people are making money. There's, it's actually still the same kind of public benefits that we go after with government. You can actually pursue cheaper on the internet. So the economics change, but it's not all about things being no cost. Um, one of the things, though, that, that is really amazing, and, and you know, people like Clay Shirky talk about this, is you can actually put in s smaller bits of energy. right? If you think about Wikipedia, I can change one sentence because I think it's not expressed well. Or I can add another fact because I know something that maybe somebody else who was here didn't. Okay. It's all those small contributions because of the nature of the technology add up into something big. And that's very different than the economics we had in the industrial era. Of course, nobody gets paid for that, right? Of the 10,000 no, people can... who want to contribute to Wikipedia? Well, there's... And that's great that they feel a, a social conscience to do that kind of thing. Absolutely. But... And, but that same set of economics changes whether you're talking about nonprofits or whether you're talking about uh, for-profits. So you have things like Amazon's Mechanical Turk, where small bits of work can be divided out and people can be paid little bits of money for it. And so I think that's the important shift. Now, then in nonprofits, you've always had people who are volunteers, people who are paid. But there's really a way for them to kind of work more fluidly together now. Hmm. Uh, you mentioned Clay Shirky a second ago, and we happen to have a quote of his here. So Shocking. let's <laughs> imagine we're having a conversation about uh, the internet, and we have a quote from Clay Shirky ready to go. One of my favorite bald men. <laughs> why, now, why would you be partial to bald men? I have no idea. No idea. Yeah, but Clay's a nice guy. He is a good guy. And uh, he, this is from Cognitive Surplus in 2010. He writes, the harnessing of our cognitive surplus allows people to behave in increasingly generous public and social ways relative to their old status as consumers and couch potatoes. The raw material of this change is the free time available to us, time we can commit to projects that range from the amusing to the culturally transformative, flexible, cheap, and inclusive media now offers us opportunities to do all sorts of things we once didn't do. In the world of, quote unquote, the media, we were like children sitting quietly at the edge of a circle and consuming whatever the grown-ups at the center of the circle produced. That has given way to a world in which most forms of communication, public and private, are available to everyone in some form. Do you, uh, I mean, I, you like this trend, obviously, right? Yeah, and I like Clay. I mean, yeah. I, I think the important thing to, in that aspect of his work to point out is, you know, when people post a video to YouTube, which my kids do, or contribute to Wikipedia, and people are, are contributing in those cases for free to this bigger kind of media landscape, what, what most of the time you're seeing is not stealing time from work, not stealing jobs away from professional people who would have been producing media, because we all still work, and we all still watch and have professional media. What's different is we're taking the time where we were just consuming media and using it also to create. And so the, the thing that really has transformed is this sense of agency, right? This sense that you, know, you and I uh, can create. And what's interesting in that, when I watch my kids, and so maybe it's wrong to say it hasn't sto you know, stolen away from the audience of, of the traditional media, because it has. Mm -hmm. When I watch my kids, you know, they watch professionally produced television and movies and all of that's the same stuff you on and I grew up on. On TV? It doesn't matter where they watch it. I mean, there's still the same economics in that. Okay. But, but what's different is they also watch stuff by other kids. Hmm. And that for them is mainstream media. It's not marginal. It's not punk rock. It's they'll watch a, a, a video by who they think might be the next Justin Bieber. But it could be a kid just around the corner. Hmm. What philanthropic opportunities are out there right now in the way that Shirky has described it here? where uh, 10 or 15 years ago, it, it just wasn't an option. But now that we live in this open, contributing world, you can do it today. Yeah, I, I think there's a bunch. Uh, you know, the, the, one of the ones I like is I, I, I like to see how thing where citizens actually can come and contribute to the, the work of government, the civic work of government, where you talked about you know, parks just being run by professionals, people working for the government. And you see some great examples where 
citizens are, because of the internet and the relationship to government through the internet, not only providing feedback into the democratic process, but actually helping make the civic world better. So, you know, one example, well, it's probably two examples by the same organization. There's a group called My Society in the UK, and they're really about how do citizens help government be better and help our society be better. And they started out with something called fixmystreet.com. And what it was, you just take your cell phone, uh, and if you see a pothole, you take a picture. You see a broken fence in a schoolyard, you take a picture. And it goes to your local councilman and to the parks department or the roads department. So all of a sudden, you have citizens who they have an incentive to say, I really would like this pothole fixed. They happen to have a cell phone. And they're now a, a free intelligence gathering system on what's broken in the city that, go, that the city is able to take advantage of. And does the city respond? Yeah. They and in do. fact, they'll keep pinging the councilman until the issue has been ticked off. And it's a very interesting example of how open source quite literally has been applied to a, a civic problem because open source has this whole history of what's called bug tracking. So if I find something broken in the software, I can just submit a, a little request and tell the developers, hey, this is broken. And then anybody can go and look at those broken things and say, ah, I'll fix it. It's basically taking that exact same system and offering it for, for the roads and the park. How is that different or better from what I see Jack Lakey doing in the Toronto Star every day, which is you know the Mr. Fix-It part, where right. he, he identifies something like that. It, admittedly, it's old mainstream media, but it's the same thing, isn't it? Well, but there's one Jack Lakey, right? And okay. the, the data flow is from somebody writing to Jack Lakey in the paper, and then maybe the, the city sees it. Here we're talking about, you know, in the, in the same way we benefit from all kinds of systems being persistent, monitoring the flows of data, telling us what do we like on Amazon.com, or how much money is there in our bank account, or reminding us to, to do you know, this, that, or the other. You're actually taking the moment where I am annoyed by that pothole, recording it as data, which is then persistent, getting mm -hmm. it into the hands of the right people, being able to monitor whether it's fixed. And so you have these data flows and feedback loops that actually make things more efficient. But you're, you're harnessing citizen energy in order to get that rolling. That's the plus side. Right. The minus side is that we get more idiocy, trolling, bullying, and other really unpleasant things going on as well. What do we do about that? Well, I mean, I, I guess the, the question is, is there actually more? Uh, I mean, I was listening to, to somebody on the way over uh, writing a book about kind of their middle school life uh, at Branksome Hall, in fact, just around the corner from here. And, you know, we've always been surrounded by bullying and trolling, right? People are people. Are people. Uh, and certainly the stats don't bear out that it's dramatically more in the cyber world. It just surfaces and, and records it. Now, I do think there is something where the anonymity, which has a lot of advantages, that comes with being online encourages that kind of behavior. But I think that's just, as with any social transformation that, that comes with communication, mm -hmm. something we're sorting out as humans. We, we sort out, but we can't really, I don't know, do we police it adequately right now? Well, you know, has the, has the answer to bullying ever been primarily policing or is it kindness mm -hmm. and social mores? Like, yes, uh, I think we do police adequately um, the really extreme cases that you need to shut down. And the same thing is, is there in the schoolyard. You know, if it gets really violent, you need the teacher to step in. Mm -hmm. But really what you want is you want to invest in, in kindness and, and caring and mutual respect. You mentioned cat videos. I love cat videos. You love cat videos? And also the Gangnam Style and the animated <laughs> GIFs and the... Apparently a lot of people... What's, what's Gangnam up to now? Is he over a billion hits now? Oh, I well, think well is. over a billion hits. Well and and I don't know if he's going to get a second, uh, second kind of shot at bat. He's made more stuff. <laughs> Nobody seems to be interested. Uh, okay, so we like that and we waste... I shouldn't say waste time. We spend our time, some might say waste it, our it, time. It's no different than Gilligan's Island. But uh, it, it, I never watched that either. Forever. That's, that's, that's a fair point. Um, do you worry, though, that we're spending too much time on that and less in the kind of collaborative, philanthropic, social change no, not arena? No. No? no, not at all. I mean, I, I think the first thing that's really important in terms of the shift is we're still consuming media in roughly the, the same uh, amount that we did growing up. I mean, maybe you didn't watch as much TV as I did, but you know, I would get home at 4 o'clock and watch it till 8 at night if my mom would, would let me. And you know, so we're, we're still consumers of media, or, or we're interfacing with media. The difference actually is that we're not just consumers. There's more agency, there's more social interaction in it, there's more me creating stuff. And, and so you know, if you look at just Gangnam Style and Psy as a specific example, it's not just that people watch that and that becomes popular. I mean, maybe that's not dif that different than 
you know, Paul Anka being discovered and becoming a big hit. You know, the Justin Bieber is the same thing, Psy is the same thing. Hmm. People always become famous. The difference is I can go and watch and make you know, one of thousands of kind of spin-off videos that are making fun of Gangnam Style, that are riffing on Gangnam Style. And that kind of ability for users to create their own media is different. And so if what we're doing is making and watching that much more creative kind of mosaic of effectively folk culture, that to me is exciting. And I guess you know, this goes into something that I work on a lot and Mozilla's become increasingly interested in. We think that folk culture, that whole idea of kind of people creating and expressing themselves on the internet is critical to the fourth literacy beyond reading, writing, and, and math. People need to know how this digital world works. Mm. As they play, as they make cat videos, they're actually figuring that out. They are, as they make their cat videos, actually acquiring and improving digital skills, aren't they? Absolutely. And right. that's a big part of what we've done is we've got this whole push on really everybody becoming web literate. We think that should be a mainstream uh, skill. One of the ways we encourage people to do it is making cat videos. Okay, now it's been in the back of my mind now since you mentioned it two minutes ago. Well, you got home at four o'clock every day and watched four hours of TV if right. mom let you. Yeah, including Gilligan's Island. I, that's what I was going to ask. What did, what did you watch for four hours every day you know, after school? Hogan's Heroes, Gilligan's Island, I mean sitcoms, right? I mean horrible, horrible stuff. Three's Company, Laugh Tracks, uh, and I think you know the, the three minute Gangnam Style and all the funny animated gifs and the would be Justin Bieber's just as enriching, possibly more. <laughs> I mean, in some ways, you just think that this, when I just watch my kids who are very much in that internet popular culture world, they're 11 and they're 13, uh, the inspiration they get by seeing other people like them being able to make it in some way, even if they've only made it by being seen by 1,000 or, or 10,000 people, that's actually really enriching for them. Having said that, um, OK, you weren't worried about that other thing I raised a second ago. Let me see if I can get you to be worried about this. The rise of narcissism, the rise of individualism. Uh, OK, it's wonderful. Online and social media is terrific uh, when it comes to the Arab Spring. Terrific. Right. Uh, how about the other side of it? You worried about that? Just in terms of people being full of themselves? <sighs> yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's certainly, you know, Andy Warhol's five minutes of, of fame is now five megabytes of fame. And, and it's become real in a way that we almost you know, never could have imagined. It was 15, uh, wasn't it? Uh, yeah, there you go. It's even, it's, and it's gone down to yeah. 15 seconds. Yeah. Um, really, he thought 15 minutes? You see how it's the, the format has changed? Back in the day, you could actually get 15 minutes of fame if you did something noteworthy. Well, he now it's five. all of us were going to get it. Yeah. Now it's not even. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, I guess in that level, I, I worry a little bit about narcissism. You know, there is also a set of feedback loops in the social world where, you know, people will, will counterbalance that and make fun of it. I guess, you know, I'm more worried about George Orwell than Andy Warhol huh. uh, in that you know, if I think about something to worry about today, it's more that we contribute to our, our own surveillance, right? Mm -hmm. So when we're on these social networks, are we throwing out information that we'll regret was up there one day? Or more importantly, are we throwing out information that in, in aggregate lets people understand stuff about us that, that we wouldn't want to have people understand? Hmm. I think that's actually one of the much bigger tensions than the personal behavior side of it. Let's do another analogy here. I think I've read where you compare where we are vis-a-vis -vis the internet uh, to the 1950s and the rising concerns about obesity. Make that compare. Have you made that comparison? I haven't, but I could right now. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I think one. Of I the, could have sworn that was you, but uh, let's. Well, make, I'll make it. I mean, I, I've talked about seat belts and yeah. smoking, and I think a lot of these things are are. Um, you know, you can see the analogies where we get to a point where something feels. Uh, quite normal and we need to raise a, a social consciousness about it. And in the case of the internet, it is some things like surveillance. I mean, we, we take for, for granted that it's fine to be out there sharing with our friends on Facebook just like we would in the rec room uh, basin. And what we need to do is actually start to build, it's why digital literacy is so critical, a set of understandings, a set of kind of skills and knowledge about, oh, when I post all those photos up there, the stuff that might be a little bit embarrassing or maybe even risque, like, here's where it goes. And, and they're kind of there forever. They can be there forever. Mm -hmm. And so even when you think they're not. Mm -hmm. And so I, I think like obesity, smoking, seat belts, we don't really care about those things for a period of time. We don't really care what we're sharing right now. It's not that we want people to stop sharing. It's we want them to understand what's the impact. Okay. It's not that you want people to stop eating. You want to eat, have them eat consciously. So you want our global web literacy to be a lot smarter, a lot sharper. What are you guys at Mozilla doing about that? So uh, we have a banner, something called WebMaker, which is really about actually using cat videos or using uh, you know, simple web pages, as well as using 
people's desire to kind of make book reports for school, but using people's everyday creation of internet content as a way to teach you how the web works. And so you might come in and make a, a, a riff on a side video, but you learn a little bit about security. You learn a little bit about how to move things across the web. You learn about some of those kind of file formats. So we've just really started that in the last year. But what we want to do in that is really build in the idea of how the web works, digital citizenship, into the everyday experience of using social media, using your smartphone, using the internet. Uh, you don't have actual classes, do you? You do this all online? No, no the idea is to embed it in the everyday experience, huh. right? So it's not even that it's classes. Although, one of the things we do do is work with a, a, a network of grassroots mentors. And so we're doing something this summer called Maker Party, where building on kind of last year, We'll probably have people in about 80 countries and probably about 1,000, 1,500 events where people take the stuff that we normally do online and sit down and teach people with it. And it's all grassroots, all volunteer. Is that Canada only? No, that's globally. That's globally. So 80 okay. countries. Uh, open badges, what's that? Well, open badges actually came out of, in some ways, this desire to do digital literacy. We said, you know, we don't actually plan to teach in a traditional classroom. We want people to learn how this digital literacy stuff uh, works in a kind of ambient way or in a self-study way online or just with friends. So how do you actually show that somebody knows something? So it's been quite popular, this idea that I can give you a badge and say, Steve, you're actually awesome at you know, making cat videos. Uh, and you know, maybe that doesn't sound like much, but you add those all up. It may be something that can get you a job. It may be something that shows that you're actually quite skilled in this digital realm. So we, uh, with a bunch of other people, built something called Open Badges, which is a way to securely give out basically digital certificates for little oh. skills that you earn. What's amazing is everybody in the world of learning has said, we need that. Because we learn in so many different places, not just school. We learn in after school programs. We learn you know, just as we do things on the internet. So what's actually started to happen is this badges idea, which we got started just to show digital skills around literacy and, and, and kind of the web, People have started to pick up to, to certify all kinds of things. Um, you know, it's, we actually ended up on stage with Bill, or I ended up on stage with Bill Clinton about two weeks back, where industry was sort of signing up to say, yeah, we want this as a way to see what people know that there is well beyond what they're learning in school. How'd you like that experience? He's big picture of me smiling. He was a great guy. <laughs> and what's interesting is handshake is very similar to Obama's. So I don't know if they trained the Democratic president. Did you get president. the, the two-handed handshake or the, or the el the No, I got, I got, well, it's kind of like a little you bit like that. that but yeah, it's a you little kind of like the elbow? No, not the, oh. no, the, the two. No. So he doesn't love you. He yeah, likes uh, you, but he doesn't love he, you. He likes me. But he didn't. Well, afterwards, yeah. he started to think about open badges. He kind of started waxing eloquent. Uh, so maybe if I'd gotten a second handshake, I would have <laughs> got the elbow. Ha have you discovered yet whether or not the open ba the badge uh, actually has any currency out there? It's too early to tell. I mean, I think there's tremendous desire on everybody's part, the, learning, the learner's part, the employer's part, the educator's part, to do something different than just degrees. Because people see it's just too big of a box. You know, you've either got, I know nothing, or I spent four years. Hmm. And so everybody is hungry for something different. Whether the badge will be the different thing, uh, we don't know yet. I mean, we've really been working on this for just a couple of years. But what we do know is we've had about 800 different educators set up to start issuing badges on every different kind of topic. And so as they get their programs going, and as everybody from NASA to community colleges to people who are doing little grassroots educational startups. Uh, so as those people start getting their stuff out there, we start to see whether people start get jobs, we'll, we'll begin to know. But I think it's going to be a few more years before we can really see. Just in our last minute here, I shouldn't be facetious about the Clinton experience, because I guess you, I mean, you did team up with his global initiative, right? The Clinton right. Global yeah, Initiative. Yeah. Did he give you money, or you give him money, or how did it, that work? The way that works is it's really just about saying, hey, this is a good idea. Let's all get behind it. Sure. Uh, and so we started out before that with 800 issuers of these badges at small and big educational institutions. Really, this is about employers and more institutions getting on board. And we've got a huge long list that came out of that CGI conference. He's impressive, eh? He is an amazing guy. You, yeah. know, you can see me on stage at that just beaming because he's just such a great presence. He looks you in the eye, and yeah. it's the old cliche. You, you're the only guy in the room for him at that moment. I was in a room with 3,000 people, and I felt that. It's amazing. <laughs> good stuff. Mark Sermon, it's awfully good of you to come into TVO and share your thoughts. Always you, a the pleasure. Executive Director of the Mozilla Foundation. Good to see you again. Oh, great. Thanks, Steve. Support Ontario's public television. Donate at TVO.org.